how does a Bitcoin transaction actually work in detail? How are UTXOs, what is SegWit, what is a transaction malleability? Let's dive in and let's explain all those things. Welcome to this second part of this Bitcoin cryptography series. My name is Julian. On my channel, it's all about making people crypto fit. On the one hand, I talk quite from a high level perspective of cryptocurrencies, blockchain, entrepreneurship and mindset. But then I really dive deep and talk about things like cryptography as today. If you're watching the entire Crash Course cryptography series, then we are part 14. And I want to congratulate you if you actually got all the way because a lot of the basics are very, very powerful and very relevant. But I know that many people kind of skip those and they want to go to the exciting things like Bitcoin. But I'm telling you, the basics are important and I'm going to be actually quite be rapid and I'm not going to go into so much of the basics because I'm going to be assuming that you understand all those things. In the last episode, not in the bonus episode, but in the episode before, we talked about how private keys go get all the way to a Bitcoin address. And now we want to go and we want to look how these Bitcoin addresses actually interact in the Bitcoin system to generate what's called a transaction ID whenever we want to update the ledger. So let's dive right into the screen share and have a look how this actually works. So basically, as an intro, we have nothing else than a transaction as an update to the public ledger. And it includes five very basic things. It includes a from, it includes an how much, a to, it gets signed, and at the end, it's basically hashed. And this hash then gets added to the ledger. And we're going to be discussing this in the next episode because this is going to be called mining. Now, in reality, and you should be know you should notice, is that the how much is not so much as an account based, it's transaction based, it's UTXO based, an unspent transaction output. And obviously, as an input, you could have several UTXOs that have to be unspent. And this is going to be checked if they are unspent. There's this database of unspent transaction outputs. Now, then you're going to create new UTXOs. And again, you could have several addresses for that. Um, for example, you could be sending something to yourself, something to someone else. For example, if you want to cut 10 Bitcoin and you want to send six to a friend and four to yourself, what actually happens is you create a new UTXO for six Bitcoin sending to your friend and four sending to yourself. And at the end, you're signing all that. And this is very, very important. And uh, obviously, the algorithm always checks that you have at least more inputs than outputs. You cannot create new Bitcoins. There's one exception to this. The very first transaction in any block does not need inputs. They're called Coinbase transactions. And the reason for this, this might be surprising, is that this is the mining reward. And this is basically how Bitcoin gets introduced into the system. Now, here is what, of course, very important. You cannot go from a Bitcoin address to the public key. So you need to include both in a transaction. So let's have a look what this looks like. We have pretty much those four things in a transaction, in the tra so-called transaction data. We have a version number, which is basically the, the metadata descriptors. We have the inputs. You can see those here as the greens. For example, here you can see an input all the way here. Then you have those zeros. Then you have some more input. And these are all basic, pretty much inputs. And then we have the blue ones, which are the outputs in this case. And you can see them separated with the zeros. And then we have a lock time, which is... Uh, more programming stuff about when can a transaction actually be used. Let's not get stuck on the lockdown. Now, what then happens is when we have this information, this information has to be unique because the UTXO is unique and the new address is maybe not unique, but combining all that is unique. Um, the odds of having a transaction ID in the past already that is the same as a new one is pretty much zero. So you should always get a new transaction ID when you hash this. And it gets hashed twice with SHA-256. Um, and then this is basically what this transaction ID looks like. And if you go to a blockchain explorer, then you can always see those transaction IDs on there. Fantastic. Now, here's then a question. Is it possible to have the same transaction ID? Well, in theory, it should not, as we discussed. But there was an instance where suddenly there was the same transaction ID in as a transaction before and everyone's thinking holy crap the bitcoin algorithm is broken how can this be and this is actually because some people were not in, informed so well 
What actually then happened was that this was a Coinbase transaction going to the same address as before. And since there's no UTXO input, it's possible to have the same transaction ID. And this was fixed then in BIP30, it was a kind of temporary fix. And basically what happened there was that there was a rule that a transaction ID is not allowed to have the same transaction ID as another one, basically forcing people to use different addresses. But then to make it very easy and convenient in BIP34, Coinbase transactions are required to have the block height, so the block number where it was included. And since this is completely unique because there's only one block reward per block, it is now impossible to have the same transaction ID. This is, I think, quite uh, a nice, but always very interesting to see what kind of things pop up and then how people react and call Bitcoin broken, even though it's not. Now, you don't see anything in here for fees. So how do fees actually work? Well, fees actually work simply by having a difference in inputs and outputs. And there you have to be careful if you kind of manually type this in, because I've seen this in the past where people wanted to send, let's say, 80 Bitcoins. And instead of putting a fee in of, let's say, one Bitcoin, they put in one Bitcoin being transferred and 79 Bitcoins worth of fee. And this is obviously a nightmare. But in most automatic systems like wallets and so on, this doesn't happen. But if people use actually lines of code in order to program that, this sometimes happens. And that's obviously very dangerous. So let's go a bit further and let's think about something else. Let's think of size. How big are these transactions? Well, there's a fixed 10 byte data storage that are present for the so-called descriptors. We need those all the time. We, we looked at them at the beginning. Um, this is for the version and uh, a lot of extra input. So we have this all the time. They are fixed 10 bytes. Um, and now we have around, for each input, we have around 180 bytes to the transaction. So depending on how many inputs we have, this gets larger and larger. Now, the interesting thing is the outputs are only 34 bytes. And why is this? We're going to be discuss this in a second. So if we add this together, we can add all this together. We have approximately 250 bytes per transaction, which we can look. There's 4,200 transactions. Uh, that, that can be a maximum. If we calculate this into the megabytes, we see that we can have a maximum of 4,200 transactions per megabyte. And this also then shows that we have a maximum of six to seven updates per second because one Bitcoin block is normally one megabyte. We're gonna look how to improve this, but this is kind of describing everything in a very rough uh, perspective. Remember, there's 1,000, approximately 1,000 kilobyte in a megabyte, so we have around four transactions per kilobyte, so around 4,200 transactions per megabyte, six to seven updates per second. Now, where, why is there a difference here? And the difference is actually leading to a problem which is called the transaction malleability. So if you've ever heard this, how does this work? The problem is that here we need to sign the inputs. That's very, very important. We need to sign the unspent transaction outputs. We need to sign them. This is important because otherwise everyone could just use them. So I need to sign those. And that's where extra size comes in because normally this would only be approximately 34 bytes. But now suddenly we have 180 bytes. And there's another problem. And this problem is what leads to the transaction malleability. If I have, and you could see this with the time delay, for example, with Lightning, I am gonna leave this time delay open so that someone can spend a transaction later. And I have a channel and then I can transact in this channel and we close this channel later so the transaction happens a lot later. What I could do is, I could then change my, my signature on the inputs and thereby the transaction ID becomes invalid. This doesn't allow me to send money somewhere else, but it would allow me by changing the signature slightly, and I'm gonna show you how this could work, by making it impossible for someone to redeem it because the transaction ID doesn't fit anymore. So we have those inputs, I sign those, the signing gets, all, everything gets hashed, but it doesn't happen that the signature goes over everything, so I could, I could have this malleability in the signatures. And so in order to show this to you, I wrote this little script. And this is not entirely correct. I'm just gonna show you, you know, a little bit from, the, from before. Basically, I'm gonna generate this private key. And so here is my private key. And now it says, and this is, now I'm using here um, a lip, an elliptic curve signature function. And it asks me, sign a message. So I'm gonna use a lowercase hello. And so I'm signing with my private key. And this is the signature that gets out. 
and this is basically from here. So now, this is the check function, okay? So now I'm verifying the, the signature from my private key. And so what happens is, if it tells me now, please paste the message, so I'm gonna type in hello, and it says, please paste the signatures. So I'm pasting the signature, and now this thing should be true. So it's the same one. So now everyone out there can actually verify that I must have had the private key. So this is basically what's happening here on the inputs. I get these inputs, UTXOs, I sign those, and everyone out there can verify, yes, true, that was Julian. But so now let's try something, and let's do this again here, but now let's write a capital, hello. So all I change is the lowercase to the lowercase to the uppercase, and people might think, oh, pfft, so who cares? Well, if we check this, obviously it gives a false, of course, because you can see, I mean, this thing is gonna look completely different if we just look at the first couple of letters, H, N, K, W, uh, w let's just change this and write an uppercase hello. Well, we have a completely different signature out of it. This is obviously the key part, how Bitcoin and all these things work. So I think always very, very nice and important to understand. So what's the solution to all this? Well, the solution is actually to fix this in a very nice way by putting the signatures out. If we remove the signatures from the actual transaction, the transaction ID cannot be changed anymore. It cannot be altered. And we have less size because we could get this out. And this is exactly what BIP141 and a few other BIPs have done. And this is the very famous SegWit or segregated witness. It removes the signatures and stores them separately the cool thing is it's a soft fork, it's an optional opt-in, so people don't have to do it, but obviously it's quite an advantage. It creates a new structure called the witness that is committed to store blocks separately from the transaction Merkle tree, something we're gonna be discussing in the, with the blockchain in the next episode. And the great part about this is that because it's stored separately, it's just the signatures, well, we can then have more space in there per transaction, and if we actually remove the signature from here, you can do the math, we're removing around 120 bytes. And this is about half of what the transaction is actually, of the transaction size. So that's where it gets really, really cool in size, because now we have twice the amount of transaction with the same kind of block size. Now, the transaction ID does not include the signature anymore. This is also not that relevant, because what the transaction then still has is, it has the froms, the twos, and the amounts, and it has the proof somewhere else, which is fine, because the, if the proofs get altered, it doesn't work anyways. But mostly important is, how much money do you have and from whom did you get it? And who, how much money can you send to someone? This is very, very important. Um, now, this is then also important. You could have a wrapper to traditional transactions, and then you have those famous Bitcoin segment addresses that start with three similar like multi-seq addresses. There is a new uh, Bitcoin improvement pr proposal called 176. Uh, these BC1, um, uh, these addresses that start now with a BC1, that's kind of their new style and that's kind of native. Um, that's going to take a little bit um, to, for, for it to work. And basically, what this shows you is how you then go from your private key to a public key to an address. How you create those UTXOs. UTXOs are nothing else than such IDs that are unspent. And this happens by having all this information, inputs, outputs, and in this case, a lock time, but the inputs and outputs have the froms, the twos, and the amounts. We talked about, <laughs> we talked about having the same transaction ID that's possible. We talked about the size of those. This is always a humongous discussion. And we talked about the transaction malleability with the signature problem on the inputs, because the signature is on the input. So you take the signatures out, you segregate it, and that's how you generate SegWit. I hope this kind of gives you a bit of light into the tunnel of how transactions in Bitcoin work. It's nothing else than cryptography. If this stuff was too fast for you, you have been missing some of the early episodes where we discuss how to sign, how to verify, how elliptic curve works, how private keys work. This is very, very, very important stuff, so you might want to check it back. If you like this, give me please a thumbs up let me know a positive comment below. If you have questions, let me know. And if you want to have more of this stuff, subscribe and check out the other videos.
I'm looking forward to see you at part three, where we talk about how to get those transaction IDs together and form what we call a blockchain. So I hope I see you back here tomorrow. And with this, yours truly, Julian. Thank you.